So good day. We are now in the second topic for the 10th chapter. So we will start with abortion because abortion is a complication during gestation. And abortion is normally uh, not a good sign because that means income will be lost. So for a farmer, any offspring from a mating is considered an income to them. And as future veterinarians, you make sure that the farmer will have his income. So what is abortion? Abortion is the termination of pregnancy before it reaches full term. This is either triggered by physical stress, disease, or exposure to abortifacient substances in feed and medication. When you say abortifacient, these are substances that induce abortion. Now, the diseases that can cause abortion can be classified into four. They can be bacterial, protozoal, viral, and fungal. The bacterial diseases that causes abortion, we have vibriosis, which is caused by Campylobacter fetus venerealis, and the affected species are cattle, and the effects on reproduction is embryonic mortality or death of the embryo, and since when you say embryo, that's early gestation, it causes early abortion. Next is leptospirosis. This is caused by leptospira interrogans with the following serovars because the serovars can be host specific. When you say host specific, they can only affect certain species. Examples of these serovars we have Pomona, Canicola, Gripotyphosa, Harjo, Ecterohemorrhagiae, and Bratislava. Leptospirosis affects all species of mammals. So what is its side effect or effect? It can cause late stage abortion, which is heartbreaking for the farmer. If the fetus will survive, they will come out as weak. So it can produce weak piglets or calves. Next, we have brosiliosis, Banks disease. When we say Banks disease, this is Brosella abortus, the one that causes abortion in large ruminants. Other Brosella species, we have Brosella militensis, which is found in your sheep and goat. And we have Brosella suis, which causes brosiliosis in pigs. What is its effect? It causes abortion, retained placenta. If the placenta is retained, it can cause sepsis. Reduced breeding efficiency, meaning eventually the animal will be less prolific. Next is listeriosis. This is caused by a bacteria called listeria monocytogenes. And it affects cattle and sheep and goats. It's known as circling disease because it affects um, certain nerves that is directly connected to the balance and brain. So animals affected by this will move around in circles. And listeriosis is considered as zoonotic because it can cause meningitis in humans. So what is the effect of listeriosis in, or in livestock? So it causes late stage abortion, which is again, heartbreaking for the farmer. For protozoal diseases, so we have only three. So we have bovine trichomoniasis, which is caused by trichomonas fetus. So this is, or trichomonas fetus, or tri trichomonas fetus. And it primarily affects, again, cattle, and it causes early abortion. 
Toxoplasmosis is affects all mammals, including humans. And its natural host are our cats. So its effect, the causative agent, by the way, of toxoplasmosis again is Toxoplasma gondii. I've already introduced this in your um, Principles of Animal Science and Economics, VEM005. And what's the effect of toxoplasmosis? It causes late abortion. Neosporosis is caused by Neospora caninum. It might sound like it's from a dog, but it was discovered from a dog, but its natural hosts are cattle. So it causes abortion in all stages of gestation. So regardless if it's an early or late, it causes abortion. For viral disease, we have bovine viral diarrhea, which is uh, which affects our cattle, and its effect is abortion and congenital defect. So if it's not if the fetus is not aborted, there can be congenital defect like calves with one eye, or calves with no anus, or calves with open abdomen. So those are the types of congenital defects, or we call them monsters. We also have infectious bovine rhinotrochitis or postular vulvovaginitis, which again affects our cattle. And it causes abortion in the second half of gestation. Another is your equine rhinotrochitis, which is caused by equine herpes virus 1, and it causes abortion in the last trimester. Then we have the equine viral arteritis, which is also known as epizootic cellulitis. The common name for this disease is the pink eye. Um, the causative agent is the equine artery virus and affects horse because it's equine. And its effect is abortion in the second half of gestation. Next, we have pseudorabies, which affects primarily our swine. So sugar rabies because it shares the nervous signs of rabies, but it's not the same virus that causes rabies. So the causative agent of sugar rabies is herpes virus, not rhabdo virus. What is the effect of the sugar rabies? Of sugar rabies, you have abortion, embryonic mortality, mummified fetuses, and stillbirth. Stillbirth are fetuses or fetus, uh, yeah, fetuses that are born inside, are, are already dead inside, and when they are being removed, once they're born, they're already dead. So that's stillborn. Mummified fetuses, they're already been dead for quite some time, and they're already mummified. So the difference is for stillbirth, they look like they just they're fresher than the mummified fetuses. Next is you have porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. This one is quite new. Um, this was discovered in 1987. So the affected species are swine, of course, as it says porcine. And this is caused by the artery virus. And the effect of this one causes abortion, stillbirth, mummified fetuses, premature farrowing, meaning they give birth days short of their full term. Respiratory disease in neonates, if ever they they're, were able to survive, but they, once they're born, they manifest coughing and sneezing, and also nursery and finisher pigs because it's primarily, it actually starts as a reproductive and then affects the respiratory system. Um, this is quite prevalent here in the Philippines, PRRS. Then lastly, we have SMEDI. SMEDI is an acronym for stillbirth, S. M is mummified fetus. 
ED is embryonic death and infertility. This affects the swine and the positive agent is enterovirus. So the effect is, what is the acronym? So infertility. Um, once that's the pig will get infected by this, um, there's chances, especially for this for both male and female, by the way, chances are they will no longer have the capacity to reproduce. So, Doc, do you, how do we, how can we diagnose these? So, in the field, um, you base it on, for abortion, you base it on what you have observed. So, let's say it's more, more pigs are, um, most of the piglets that were born from an abort, uh, abortion has, most of them are mummified. So, you already know what it is. And there are also test kits available. So later on in your immunology, you will find out what are those test kits and what do they detect for. Fungal disease, we have aspergillosis, which causes mycosis. So affected species are your cattle. And the primary suspect for this is the species are aspergillus fumigatus, but also you have abscidin and mucor. So it causes abortion in the middle and last trimester. So this is you what you call mycotic abortion. So by the way, this is a cotyledon. And this is a placenta. So these are the uh, cotyledons in the placenta of a of a baby cow of a calf that was aborted. This one is a normal cotyledon. This one here. While this one, the thick, the thickened one, with yellowish white plaques in the middle, those are the ones that have been infected by the Aspergillus fumigatus by the fungi. So it causes abort abortion. We also have a list of abortifacient plants. We have the root, red rooted pigweed, the chugella. Milk vetch or lockweed, juniper, alfalfa, ponderosa, fine, clovers, and skunk cabbage. I mentioned this because um, some of you might be going abroad, might practice abroad, and most um, practices abroad, they pasture their animals. And like here in the Philippines, we put them in certain places and they just feed there. But in areas where there's a lot of land, they let them go pasture during the day and um, lock them up in the evenings. So these are the stuff or these are the plants that you really have to be worried about. We also have vitamin A or retinol. So any deficiency or toxicosis can cause abortion. So vitamin A is along with other fat soluble vitamins is not really, you are not allowed to regularly have them supplemented because any excess of vitamin A will go to the fat. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. And I've met a lot of, uh, I've met one case before in the hospital where I used to work, where in the, the, the owner likes to give vitamin A supplements to his bitches. And it turned out some of the puppies that were delivered via cesarean section were monsters. They don't, I can see their brains, they don't have a cranium, they don't have a brain case. Some of them I can see their um, their internal organs because there's no skin on it. Some of them don't have um, buttholes or anus. Call it atresha ani. So those are the things that you really have to be very careful of when you're going to supplement um, vitamins, particularly fat-soluble ones. Now we move on to parturition, which is the process of giving birth. So here are the different parturition terms depending on the species. So we have whelping, so bitches giving birth to puppies, calving, cows giving birth to calves, farwing, sows giving birth to piglets, lambing, ewes, ewes giving birth to lambs, and foaling, 
Mary Skippenberg Falls. So, assignment. What are the parturition terms for goats, cats, and, and rabbits? So that is your assignment. Now here are some physiological changes in the last days of gestation. When you say physiology, function. First is the expansion of the pelvis, which is due to the secretion of relaxin and estrogen, which results in the enlargement of the birth canal in preparation for the expulsion of the fetus. There is also demineralization of the pubic symphysis. Um, later on in your anatomy, we'll find out where is the pubic symphysis, allowing the birth canal to expand. We also have sinking around the tail head, where in the soft tissues around the tail head will appear sunken, and the tail head is far more prominent, especially before parturition. This is because the pelvic ligament tends to relax due to the influence, again, of relaxin and estrogen. We also have lactation. So lactation, most of the dams are already producing milk. And then we have temperature. Most dams, except for sows, are about to give birth, will experience a decrease in their body temperature. In sows, on the other hand, they tend to increase their body temperature. But between the, five, the four, lactation, provided that it has been confirmed via ultrasound that the animal is indeed pregnant or via um, rectal palpation or blood sample, it's lactation that is the marquee that the animal is about to give birth, a marquee sign. Because temperature, it's not really reliable. But for pigs, they do tend to increase their body temperature about to give birth. So that's the reason why before farrowing, most of the farm hands will shower the sows. So if you have observed that in some of the farms, if you guys have farms. We also have physical changes prior to parturition, which includes the softening of the vulva, the softening and the swelling of the vulvas. We're about to give birth there. The cervix is dilated upon internal exam. Internal exam is you put for smaller animals like dogs, you can put a finger onto their vulva and check for cervix if it's dilated already. For larger animals, you can have the entire arm. You also have mucus stringing from the vulva and of course the rupture of the amniotic sac. When you say amniotic sac, that's the water bag. Behavioral changes. You also have to check on behavioral changes, which includes isolation from the rest of the flock or herd. This is very true, especially in cows. They tend to isolate themselves. They also have nesting behavior. So they will find a safe spot, like for example, for bitches. And queens, they look for an area where it's dark and not off, no, it's not often being no human traffic. They love that. Off feeding, except in horses. So they try, they will not eat because they are experiencing pain. For horses, they still eat. Distress, so they're anxious. They look around. So that's one of the changes that you also have to observe and of course sweating which is only being observed in horses so what are the triggering factors for parturition the fetus is thought to release cortisol cortisol is a hormone produced by the adrenal gland which you have seen in the estrus cycle video which is located anterior or above or cranial to the kidneys so the fetus will release its own cortisol to, into the maternal circulation. This is because the fetus and the fetus and the dam share the same circulation via the umbilical cord and the placenta. Because of this placenta, because of this, the placenta increases the production and release of estrogen. And due to estrogen, the uterine muscles will begin to contract and prepare to expel the fetus. 
the uterus will release prostaglandin F2 alpha that causes the regression of the corpus luteum. Without the corpus luteum, there will be a decrease in progesterone. <coughs> Excuse me. The drop of progesterone further stimulates uterine contractions. So the first stage of parturition will include positioning of the fetus. So normal position or eustachia, the front feet pointing out the cervix, right side up with the chin resting on its four legs or the front legs. Of course, the cervix is dilated and exposure to the fetal membranes to the vulva with possible rupture of the amniotic sac. So this is the right position. We call this the Superman position. Second stage of parturition will include uterine contractions will intensify, the dams will press on their abdomen, and then of course, finally, we have the expulsion of the fetus. Third stage of parturition will include expulsion of the placenta. For horses, it's 15 minutes after foaling. In swine, it's one hour after farrowing. For cattle, it may take up to 12 hours after calving. Common problems in parturition would include dystocia, which is the abnormal orientation of fetus upon birth, retained placenta, and prolapsed uterus. So these are examples of dystocia, dystocia um, malposition or dystocia. So you have it here. You also have this one. This one is quite challenging, this one here. So what you do with this one is you really have for this position, okay, unlike this position, it's a superman. Both front legs are in front. This one is the Darna position, where in only one, if you're not familiar with Darna, she is a Filipino heroine, and it's only she only races when she flies, it's only one arm or one yeah one arm is raised up this is the darna position so what you do with this one is you make sure you pull this one you pull the four leg the uh, proceed uh, proceeding foreleg and gently once you pull this in and then the head gently try to retrieve the other leg and then you can pull that up. For this one, is quite challenging. This is the reverse Dharna. So what you do is go for the head, push the head. When you push it towards the vulva, make sure you, you push it together with the contractions, which is quite challenging. For this one, you really have to feel so you put your arm here to the vagina and into the cervix. And then you look for the hind legs, both hind legs. And you try to push, straighten the, 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 the hind legs and then push towards the vulva. For this one, uh, this is Superman position but the neck and the head is at the back uh going is not at the back but facing the head sorry so what you do is you just change the position of the head and the neck move it forward gently and then you're good to go this is a prolapse uterus so this is from a heifer a cow rather so this is the caruncles so with this one you really have to clean this up um for livestock unfortunately they will put this cow down because most likely she will also have this condition on her next parturition or calving so they will have to put this cow down euthanize unfortunately Postpartum care. So observe the offspring and make sure there are no obstructions on its nose and mouth. So you, you really have to because the moment they're already out or they're 
when the moment they're already when no the moment the dam is already um having contractions they already lost their their placental uh the placenta the their placenta is already loose from the uterine wall meaning you it's a small period of time where in they're no they're no longer breathing so you really have to make sure that you get rid of any obstructions in their nose and mouth so they can breathe on their own number two watch how the dams and neonates interact especially if it's the primiparous or when you say primiparous first pregnancy because sometimes dams will not recognize that they're actually they actually gave birth to that animal i'm sorry there's the cats beside me so they're very um check how they will respond so if the dam will not entertain her calf let's say it's a cow um make sure you let her smell it because as much as possible the newborn has to be taken care of by the dam immediately once it's already out of her the newborn could already stand and suckle shortly after birth you also have to check for temperature temperature um temperature below normal can cause death to the animal also the interaction with the dam and the neonate is very important because it's the dams that will help warm up the newborn most causes of death in neonates is actually hypothermia low body temperatures so that's the one that you really have to monitor and remember when we discuss also in BEM005 the farrowing units has to be heated right in the housing so that's to make sure that the piglets will not get hypothermia colostrum so the colostrum is an ingredient in the milk which has to be given in the first 12 to 24 hours of their lives and it has it is actually rich in antibodies which can protect them from diseases on the first months or first weeks of life so neonates must ingest 7 to 10 percent of its body weight within the first 12 to 24 hours after birth so that's it so we're almost done on the next topic we will have lactation and the importance of milk suckling until then i'll see you later guys and take care